this back in the 80s and 90s, um, but with the best of intentions, and it was attractional at that point, thinking if, they're, if we just get them in the building, that somehow they'll figure out um, the integration or that they'll be curious enough to come back on Sunday or that that relationship will be strong enough to bring them back on, on Sunday. And we're finding that um, without some real intentional integration, that that is um, not the case. I work with um, churches across uh, the country, and whether it's 50 or 100 or 200 children that might be coming and going throughout the week, um, we're, we're just missing that piece. And it's always been my heartache to think of all of those children coming and going and have no connection or integration into the, the life of the church. So because of that, I've been working for the last couple of years um, with a colleague um, named Michael Scott on, on this model. So I, again, I'm famous for it. I'm gonna just live into the reputation once again this morning of um, covering, I think I have 20 minutes here, cover a whole lot of ground um, and uh, give you just a sampling of what the table and the children's table um, are about. So I think I can share a screen here, it looks like. I think you gave me permission to do that. I um, believe you should. Be able to see all of that. Y'all seeing okay? Yes. Okay. All right. So you all just speak up if you have anything, because I'm just going to fly to give you as much um, information as possible here in our time together. So um, <laughs> as Dave said, um, everything I kind of do um, is um, based in a book, it seems like. Inside Out is kind of the basis of, of this model and the why. I always start with the why. And all of the resources always are resource-based in helping small groups within a church leadership normally to process through this information and get to the why to help you think about um, this kind of ministry. So Inside Out talks about what is it that we need to do um, to um, evert, yes, that is a word, I did not make that up, um, turn our, our uh, ministries inside out for this new day and this new time. Um, so often we think that we have to either do ministry or that we can do something, um, that, uh, makes some sort of creates resources for us, um, but they can't be one in the same. And I believe that we can have ministry that does both. And so often I run into daycares or preschools that say, yeah, we make money. And when they say that they make money, they simply say, oh, well, we were able to pay all of the salaries and all of the supplies. Um, oh, and maybe get a little bit at the end of the year back to, um, to the church. Um, I, I'm talking a model that is comparable to childcare and preschools that are in the secular world. Um, and some will say, but we're not supposed to be for profit. That's correct. Um, and there are always extenuating circumstances at local levels. But what I'm saying is it gives us the opportunity to reinvest those dollars back into ministry to shore us up um, even better. So the other thing that I think we have to be reminded is Wesley was a social entrepreneur from the very beginning. If there was a need in the community, Wesley is the one that was the one that did the was the first publisher. Um, when there was a need in the community, he was the one that said, we have children that need homes. He started the orphanages at schools and hospitals and so on. So this is not unusual for us as a community um, to think in this way. When we bring up the whole community, um, when we bring up those that need jobs, when we bring up um, those in need, it brings the whole community um, up. So the table is a unique postmodern network of faith communities, spiritual com communities, desiring to reach younger generations through integrated micro communities. We're finding that the younger generations that we're having trouble reaching, um, we, we thought a few years ago that they wanted, you know, the big um, kind of communities, the large churches where they could hide in the dark, you know, where there was lots of um, music and on stage and lights and smoke and all of that. We're finding they like the smaller, 
micro communities where there's more intimate relationships where they can really um really explore and and have deeper relationships and what they appreciate about Methodism that I think we just kind of take for granted I know myself as a fourth generation I have to remind myself is we get to explore and question and that is certainly who we are as, as Methodists and so if we can offer them that and in particular who are the ones that are parents right now they're the millennials they're the Gen Z's and they're the ones that are primarily missing out of our faith communities um, in our churches. And so the very ones we're trying to reach are the ones that are having children. And they're the ones that are struggling to figure out how do we help um, our children. As a, as a matter of fact, um, Lily has a new grant out right now that they're looking for um, organizations that can help parents and caregivers um, help form, help parents and caregivers form their children's faith because parents are saying the church is no longer able to help us do that in a way that we feel is relevant and competent. And so how is it that we can do this in a different way that um, is accessible um, to, to these communities? So what is it that makes the table, which is the faith com community part of it, um, and then the children's table is the preschool daycare piece of it. What, what is this unique about it? So it's built around these multiple micro communities. It moves the church away from the Sunday centric, building centric and pastor centric model, which I think is the way um, of the future. We're already moving towards that. Um, it moves towards community oriented and by community, I mean the neighborhood who we're called to serve. It's very relationally focused relational with um, not only those that are already gathered, but really relationally focused with our community and with those we're trying to reach. And it is primarily laity driven. The laity are the ones that are leading these micro communities themselves. Um, and it, it mobilizes us to think about things outside the church um, and it prioritizes uh, disciple making. Um, and so therefore it decreases the cost of paid staff because it gets the laity back to doing the, the ministry, which was always the intention to begin with. So the shifts uh, of all of this kind of ministry um, is the investment of, of those hours from, from Sunday and also from uh, many times staff to um, those that are volunteering. And it, it also disperses kind of all of those relational and discipling throughout the week. Um, it significantly shifts the activity and expectation from the, the receiving community, receiving those that are already gathered and those that we want to gather on Sunday to discipling and relationally driven throughout the week. Um, it helps um, shift the discipleship back to the family. Um, you know, we, we got to the point where you know, the children's church was even separate from the worship of the family. And that is now being, you know, asked, did, did that serve uh, as a, um, as a disconnection for parents to not even be able to disciple their own children? Was that part of the disconnect for all of it? And so they're wanting to know, how do we, how do we form our own faith while we're helping form our own children's faith? Um, so, and it's also a shift from um, the preference driven of those of us that are already gathered to much more about what is it that we have to do to reach these um, folks that are now more disconnected from the church than ever as those numbers rise year after year after year. And it shifts worship to be much more experiential, relational, non-location specific, non-day specific, and gathered, yes, at the table. What does this look like? So, it's very different than what you and I are used to as the traditional model. In week one, you have a small group micro community again that will gather in what we call as a round table. Content is already provided and it might start from a video. It might start from an article um, and, and there are questions then that um, are that, that this small group then processes to help them think about their spiritual life in a way that they is accessible and that they don't feel threatened by. 
Then in week two, again, it's driven by um, an app, content's already provided. We ask them um, to act within um, what they're learning out in the community. So their small group, their round table, then takes what they're learning and say, how do we go out and serve our community um, in a way that um, fits within the theme of the month? Week three, we come back to the, the round table again um, and content is provided with conversation. And then on week four, it is a worship experience. We call it the table experience where these micro communities all come together and uh, they, you and I would call it worship, but it's a place where the person who is leading, um, there would be probably um, a song or two that is probably an acoustic guitar, maybe a beatbox, not the big band on the, uh, you know, in the, up on the stage. Um, and it's more secular driven. So people might um, recognize this song. And then there's storytelling as opposed to a sermon. And then there are experiences at the table, whether it's an activity or questions or a combination, or maybe there are um, different um, experiences that they go to, rotate through in the room, and then everyone shares a meal um, together, multi-generational um, at the table. And of course, then um, there is prayer. And um, then we, we call it, you know, tie the bow. They bring it back together at the end to tie all of the experiences together and send them out. Each of those experiences also have what we call table talks. So this is not only are you processing with a small group, but there are also questions to say, how do you continue this conversation at the table you're experiencing, at, at the table that you belong to? So it helps you continue that um, discipling. It continues to offer those conversations, spiritual conversations, because many people that we're trying to reach are spiritual, but not religious. You hear that all the time, right? I'm spiritual, but not religious. And so it gives these approachable questions all again within the theme to take back to your family. Maybe it's an introduction of it um, with friends over dinner, because we believe that life happens around the table, whether it's the dinner table, the conference table, your desk is a table, the coffee table, the end table, all these things around the table, and of course, the communion table. So most people are already at tables. We're just trying to give them um, the tools, the content, um, ways to have spiritual conversation that are approachable and ways that, um, that are, are not scary and ways that they can explore um, spirit without them feeling like they're going to be threatened or that they're going to be put on the spot. Now, you and I would call fifth Sundays, right? What's well, a quarter? Um, we call we would call them corporate server, something like that. We call it the traveling table, where um, the location then would take all of their micro communities and do some sort of corporate serve or corporate evangelism um, event. So that's kind of the rhythm um, that is part of uh, the table. Um, so it's it can within an existing church it can almost be like a church plant within a church so people can explore there are some where it, it can be within an existing church and some might use this as their small group experience and still continue with their traditional worship but it might be that um that this is also this other brand new community that is kind of coming up between this is what the app looks like when you download it um, on your cell phone um, and besides the round table, which is a small group experience, there's all sorts of other, again, I'll use the, the terminology side door approaches where people could um, uh, be invited into the community for another micro um, community that, that will hopefully feed into um, the round table, but it might be a dateable. So it's a singles group um, or habitable. It might be um, under housing um, kind of ministry, harvestable, um, could be a community garden, um, preventable, of course, um, that is um, prevention of all, all sorts of 12-step kind of programs and that kind of thing. So that just gives you um, a sneak peek of some of the other kind of side ministries that can all be part of, of this. So how is the table being applied? A variety of different ways. Again, um, as I already suggested, you can start kind of this church within a church model. Um, it, it can also be used to start a new ministry. 
Um, so can you can imagine that the launch team of a new ministry starts this way. This could be a fresh expression and um, launch. This could be the discipling piece because there's um, also through the app, there's the tithing piece. Um, there is the, um, the whole data management piece of it. Um, you can chat within your own round table group. There's the prayer wall. Um, there is um, the way to um, also post pictures and so on. So it's kind of this whole data management um, unique uh, and, and it's one of a kind app that, that we put together. Also a seasonal ministry. So imagine um, you've got snowbirds that go to the south. And so you've got a lay servant ministry or, um, a, you know, you've got somebody um, who is um, maybe a, a, an associate pastor at a church and they're going to go to um, the um, retirement um, RV park and do um, the table with those that um, are there for that three to six month kind of period. Um, for those that um, are dealing with disaffiliations, the remnant left behind, this is being used as a tool um, for those to kind of gather and um, find a place to disciple and heal um, before they decide kind of what they're going to do. Or maybe they just end up being that fresh expression. And, and this is kind of their way to gather around this. So, um, and again, it's being used um, for its app content communication and so on. So the children's table then becomes um, an add-on. It's almost like it's its own micro community that um, is part of um, the, the table. So you don't do the children's table without the table because the table is the integration piece um, that is so important that so many churches miss, right? So we, we want to be able to reach children and their families, but without that, that back-end integration piece that's very intentional, um, then, then we're going to miss the boat. So you can do um, the table without the children's table, that you certainly don't do the children's table without the table. Hope that makes sense. So during COVID, we lost 16,000 child care centers in the U.S. We were already in a child care uh, crisis before then, and this just added to it. Um, so we're finding that, um, that churches can meet this very critical need um, in our communities, um, because of course, not all 16,000 of those have, have reopened. Um, we have buildings um, that aren't being used um, during the week. Um, we're also finding that part-time programs are really hard to be sustainable. Um, and, and you're using you know, the building for only three or four hours. Um, and um, most families have both working parents and um, they usually need uh, more extended care. And who are the ones having children? Again, it's the very demographics that are missing from our church. And so it's almost like when, when you open up um, a preschool or a child care center, the very people you're trying to reach are going to come to you because you're providing a service that is most needed in the community. So when I do visioning with churches, so often it's like, what is it that, that you are meeting the need or filling the gap in the community? And if, if this is, and in, in most communities it is, um, and in New York, there are childcare deserts all over the place. Um, if you're meeting that need, then it's so much easier to reach the very people you're trying to reach. Then you're able to leverage your space um, in your building um, for ministry, for integration, and for profit. And I use that term loosely. I know that that kind of is a hot button for people, but it's profit that is that is reinvested back into um, the ministry for, for your church. Um, we um, have a five-fold approach. Um, so it is an experiential learning development because again, you want to um, ready your children um, for the kindergarten experience. But we know that um, through research, the first three years um, are critical in the formation of, of children in their learning and particularly in their faith formation. And so often we don't do a whole lot. You know, we're waiting until they get to their, those preschool years. So if we have them from age zero to five and we're doing this piece of experiential learning, but social emotional development, which is critical right now, um, mental health is an issue and the social emotional development is, is a piece of that. 
But we see this as a holistic approach, not just for the child, but for the entire family. So you're not just providing um, a learning experience or you know a, a, a caring um, environment for the, the child, that this is a way to wrap your arms around the entire family and offer spiritual integration. Um, then if we offer the development pieces around the business and administration. You don't have to figure out the business model. And then it is leadership development of the staff. Um, and then we're teaching those characteristics within the, um, the actual child care center as well. Once all of those are up and going and we, so once those are a well-oiled machine, then we encourage the centers to add on mental health and family services. Mental health is a critical need. Um, all sorts of additional um, kind of grants that are available for that. And then there's ways to partner with your community um, to offer those um, so that the community outside the church is, is getting that need met. Plus, you're finding those needs met for the families that you're taking care of um, at the children's table. The family services are very contextual based on um, the, the type of families um, that, that you're serving. What is the intentional ministry integration? Because to me, this is the key piece. So there is weekly chapel time. Now, as I said, all of the content is provided for you. And so what you want is that the, the, what's going on in the life of the church um, and, and the table talks is integrated into the chapel time. So the, the chapel time, so pastor, director, whoever, the, um, maybe you have a, a children's ministry coordinator, whoever is the appropriate one, goes in every week with the children and, and at the child care center, and they do what we call a tiny table talk. And it is related to the theme of, of, the, um, of the month. And so they spend some time um, with them. It, is, um, it, it incorporates spiritual practices and fruits of the spirit and so on. After that tiny table talk, then there is um, also through um, the app of the, um, of the, of the child care center, there's a note that is sent home and it says, hey, um, Pastor, um, Pastor Emily talked about this with your children um, today in um, tiny table talks. To continue this conversation at your table with your family this week, Here's some questions to help spur that conversation. So it is helping from the very beginning. These families begin to have spiritual conversations. You're helping them even thinking about, you're not using these words, of course, disciple their children at home from the very beginning. Then um, you're also um, helping with those table talks from those round tables with those additional questions for their families. Um, there's monthly themes um, to mirror, mirror. So when they're in those groups, um, everything is, is intentional and it's all talking about the same thing. So they don't feel you know, like they've got two or three things going on. Um, it's a whole culture of holistic family approach. We call it layered and wrapped. So it's a, it's a culture of your staff listening to your families. So for instance, um, if, if, the, if the staff of the child care center is going, boy, I, I keep hearing things about um, the parents really struggling with these toddlers and parenting. So then, you know, we bring in um, someone who has a specialty in um, parenting toddlers, right? Because we're their partner in, in helping them with um, quality of life holistically in their family. Then once a quarter, we do um, parent connection events where we provide childcare, you know, to jammy and movie night um, at no cost, of course. And then um, those parents are given dinner. We give them a spiritual um, kind of connection event where they're, they go to maybe one restaurant and they have um, maybe hors d'oeuvres and we give them questions to process at their table. They're spiritual, but not religious questions. And then they go to another place and they have the main um, course, and they have another question, and so on to a different um, restaurant, and um, and then maybe they had their dessert at the end of the night. That, you know, how was it to have a conversation with other adults? You didn't have to cut their meat. You actually got to um, have your whole meal while it was still hot. You didn't have to get up and take someone to the to the restroom. You know, 
are these the kind of relationships that that you're missing now that you have uh, children? Um, did you learn some things? Did you make some new friends? Um, did you feel um, heard and um, supported in a different way? If this was meaningful for you, um, we'd like to invite you into continuing these conversations at a round table with parents who are in this stage with you. Um, and so you're connecting them into a round table because again, you're being very intentional with helping integrate them into um, the life, uh, into a micro community. It, they may, here's the thing I want to, I really want to emphasize though, it's not to get them necessarily into a Sunday morning worship experience that may never be their jam, right? But as long as they are coming into a spiritual community where they're being nurtured and you're helping them also form their children's faith um, and, and they're getting into worship experiences at the, the table experience, that then we feel like they have a micro a spiritual community where they're being formed. Hey, I'm gonna so, I'm gonna yeah. interrupt I'm gonna interrupt you just because of time. Yes. Um, you have you've done a remarkable job um, of introducing us to this. And it's ex it's extremely exciting from my perspective what you're what you've been doing. Yeah. And um, my sense is that people may have some questions i know you yeah. have more to share but because of yeah. our time commitments today i'm gonna yeah. maybe ask that if people have follow-up questions if you could give us um an easy way for people to contact you there you go yep yep um, why don't i just uh, i'll put my um, email address in the um in the chat How about that would be great i really appreciate that absolutely and um, absolutely. my sense is that we could spend quite a bit of time with people just asking you questions. Um, is there someone here who has a, a burning question because you're just confused about something right now and, and you're 100% sure that I can't help? <laughs> um, please feel free to ask Kay a question right now before we pray and let her go. I don't see the email. the The chat came and went. Okay. I, oh, there it is. You see it there. Good. Yeah, it pop, it pops up, but then you got to click on the chat box because it it vanishes. <laughs> okay, this is um, wonderful stuff, and um, I I feel like I want to connect you and Anne with each other because I feel like you need to hear what Anne Canfield, who's a uh, kind of co-teaching this launch pad with me what she's been doing in watertown new york um which has a lot of the same kinds of themes going on and um just i think you should just be aware of it and um, what we're actually trying to do in this launch pad is to multiply um her approach to you know creating um community partnerships and relationships with children and serves in a community that um, is connected to Fort Drum, um, one of the armed services, you know, groupings in our state and um, has been reaching families with enormous needs there and um, in many ways uses many of the same kinds of approaches that you're talking about. Um, so I feel like the two of you probably should talk at some point just so you can... <laughs> You know, Anne can share that with you and you can be aware. Maybe you and Anne can write a book sometime. There you go. Uh, yeah. I'll yeah. email you, Kay. I'll email you. What a, Sounds blessing. Great. what a blessing. You fill in huge gaps. And um, I, I love what you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I appreciate the opportunity um, to share. And I hope maybe there's something in there that uh, each of you might be able to, to, to use just to um, maybe help what you're doing. Yeah, so we, you know, as you if you're aware of Launchpad, you know, part of the experience is thinking about discernment, you know, season of discernment and the season of visioning, and these folks are all at a point of kind of developing some clarity around their approach, their, you know, the how how we're going to reach people and and invite people, new people into discipleship, especially unchurched families and their children, um, and so this is this is a great example 
And I think some it's nice that you're creating content that people can just plug into. You got a group of lay people that have a lack of confidence about creating content and asking good questions. You know, to give to give resources like this is really a gift. So um thank you, Kay, very much for your time. And absolutely, if- absolutely. And the best to you all. And again, I appreciate that opportunity to come and share with you all. Good luck to you all on uh, on your um on the projects that you're discerning. Thank you, Kay. Thanks. Thanks and let's, good to see you all. If you could allow me to pray. Oh, absolutely. Okay, All for, for the impact that you continue to have around the around the world. And just that let's just lift lift that up. Let's pray. Thank you. Thank you. God, you are um so good to us. And um we're just so grateful for the gifted people that you bring us in relationship with, for the vision that they have for a different way of being the church. And today we're especially grateful for Kay Kotan and for her all that she has to share with us. Thank you for this model of the table and the children's table and uh, the ideas that it is bringing to mind for me and I'm sure for others, the, the ways of connecting that can be so significant. And I just pray for Kay, for her family, and for all the work that she's doing around the world right now that you would multiply what she has already offered to others, that it would bring more and more people to know your son, Jesus Christ. Be with us this day and help us to bring honor to your name, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you all and have a great day. Love you, friend. Take care. Bye now. Bye-bye. So that was, you know, ideally I had invited Kay to come Um, Last time we were together when we were talking about different ways of envisioning, you know, kind of the how to, because I wanted you to hear that before these last two weeks that we've had so that you could be kind of bringing all that into play as you're thinking about your vision. Um, But that was not that was not to be. So we're grateful for this. And um, again, we will be uh, we have quite a bit of content to get through today. But the first thing I wanted to do is to just give all of you a chance to just go around and and briefly share what again, this is just this is not a final. There's no expectations for you to have this down pad and for this to be the final answer or anything like that, because vision does shift over time. But I was wanting to give you a chance, just like we always do at Launchpad, the experience Anne could tell you at Launchpad is normally at this point in the process, we invite, we have this crazy thing where 40 people in the room all just begin to go around and find one-on-one conversations. And they everybody has literally one minute to share their kind of their elevator speech with each other. We blow a whistle everybody moves, you find another partner. For, so for about 10 minutes, you have six different conversations where you get the opportunity six times to do what you're about to do right now. And it's really, everybody says it's a chance. To, I, it's the first time I said it out loud. <laughs> and as I spoke, it actually became clear for me as I spoke it out loud. So this is a really important step, I think, in the process is for you to speak out loud what you think God is calling you to do. Anne has a very particular vision. Kay has a very particular vision around this thing called the table and the children's table. Um, I'm not expecting you to have that kind of a formed vision right now, but maybe you do. Maybe God has been speaking to you and it's starting to take shape. So you're going to take 30 seconds to give us your take on the vision and then to follow that up with the way we think that that might work out is, and then list some descriptions about where and when, kind of what the pacing of that will be. I loved how in the table, there's very clear pacing, right? There's a there's a week with small groups. There's a week where we get together to serve. There's another week with small groups. There's another week where all the small groups get together for worship. Um, and Anne has described something like that too, that once a month, there's this group gathering that's more more looks something more like worship so again it's the it's the vision it's the where it's the when it's the pacing and then it's the um 
um, the how, what's the strategy for reaching new people? That's what I'm inviting you to talk about, just for a couple of minutes, each of you. All, all that in 30 seconds, huh, Dave? Well, no, no. You're going to the 30 second piece. You're going to do all that in about two minutes. Oh, okay. All right. So your 30 it's seconds like is CPE. just that first statement. The, the elevator speech. If you had 30 seconds in line with somebody at the grocery store, how would you describe this the new thing? I, and then I, flush I, it out. I, I can jump in. I mean, I, I've been at a Sydney UMC here for about five years, and I was naive enough to think what I thought my full calling here would be was what I thought it would be. And God always has a sense of humor. So with the uh, with the area team that myself and Reverend Bob Clark are working on with a, a lot of the churches around here, I'm seeing sort of like a, an integration. And, and I really like the, the presentation that Kay just had. Uh, we already have a map, a ministry action plan for our area team. Unadilla UMC, for example, has a uh, monthly vacation Bible school. Unadilla Center now has one or has had one for a long time during winter break. So I envision, uh, as a lot of churches want, and what church doesn't want more, more kids and young families, single mothers, et cetera, but trying to take the area team and, and having more of an integrative model. And the reason I say that is because a lot of our churches are small. And I don't know how big K's demographic is, which I, I guess it doesn't matter per se, but if your church has 10 or 15 people, this is kind of a daunting task. So by drawing from area Methodist churches, and we even have a Presbyterian church, we then have a, a critical mass and a conglomeration. Um, how that then fans out, um, I, I don't know, but like, like, for example, we have a coffee house in March in Unadilla, and um, <clears throat> Unadilla has a ministry called Breakfast in the Basement, so our next area team meeting will be there in uh, two or three weeks, and we're going to have different people and, and have different strategies. So what what's sort of melding together right now is this kind of regional ministry thing where we're doing a whole bunch of stuff together. And um, <clears throat> I could see this kind of kind of being a being a piece of that. And I, and I guess I don't fully know how that is. I I don't want to give it to, to my team and. You know, what do they say, Dave, throw it up the ladder and see if it sticks, right? So um, I think they'd be excited about it. They, they'd probably have to uh, take some time to to kind of get their mind around it, you know. And, and our team has only been meeting for about, I don't know, 16 months. So we're still kind of in our infancy, but we've seen a lot of good stuff happen. So that I, I think it's great. Who, who doesn't want more kids? And, uh, and and young families in their church. I've never, never met a pastor that said, don't want those folks, you know? Um, so that's what I would say. Um, I, I'd like to show them some of this information and, and let, let them digest it. Because, you know, we're Methodists. We fill something out and the next day we we have it all figured out. And I, and I think that that's not necessarily the best approach. So, so that's what I got, folks. Thank you. Anybody else? No, I don't. I don't know that I have a specific elevator pitch that's all that different from what we just heard. The congregation here um, developed a vision statement a couple of years ago that, that really still fits what we're working towards. This um, this idea of something like the table and children's table just kind of gives structure to the vision. Our vision is that we are committed to meeting needs, fostering relationships, pursuing justice and making space for all to thrive. And so uh, the idea behind something like the table and children's table um, it is that we would be doing that amongst a demographic whose needs are not being met. Um, and we, when we wrote our vision statement, we listed that first on purpose because we noticed that most often when Jesus engaged in uh, evangelism, if you will, um, he would meet a person's physical needs first and then talk to them about faith. He would heal them and then say, your faith has made you well. He would, he would feed that or, or the woman at the well, you know, he, he there was water first and then there was conversation about living water right like so he yeah. always he, he would often meet people's needs first he didn't try to preach until after he fed the five thousand with the loaves and fish because people who are hungry are not going to hear what you want to teach them about 
space. Um, and so, uh, you know, my my take, it, our take here is that by by meeting the childcare needs in the community, we we make it so that people are more ready to receive a message of faith. Um, by meeting needs through fostering relationships, which is another part of our vision statement, meeting needs, fostering relationships, pursuing justice, making space for all to thrive. When we do all of those things, um, then we show the community that we give a darn, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. that, that we're here for them rather than the other way around. Um, and so, yeah, I know that's not a concise elevator pitch. I think the concise elevator pitch would be our vision statement. Yep. Uh, structurally, here at Geneva, we we are um, very much wrestling with the idea of subscribing to the table and children's mm -hmm. table. Mm -hmm. Have you done enough research? I'm sure others in the group are curious about the cost of of you know, having access to the app and all their materials. Yes, I don't remember where I put that document. Um, there there definitely is a cost associated with it, of course. Uh, there's, a, there, there's a consultation fee for Kay and Michael to look at your physical mm -hmm. site. So either they fly out and look at it in person or you send them blueprints and, and that sort of thing. Um, because part of what they have access to is uh, all of the different state laws about how many children per square feet in a classroom and how many teachers per child, depending on age and all mm -hmm. of that kind of, all of those rules and regs. And so the first thing they'll do is work up a pro forma where they show you what is fiscally possible in your space. In other words, could this be profitable? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and so there's a cost with that and then after that there's like a an initial sign-on fee and then an annual subscription fee um which grants you access to all like the app and all of the content mm -hmm. that that she was talking about um there are curricular materials they have uh education experts that they've been working with to develop these um they have all sorts of trainings and everything that Kay was talking about. Mm -hmm. Really, it's kind of like they they have a, assembled all of the experts one might need to start up <laughs> to start up a ministry like this, and then you just subscribe and have access to all of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't remember the the exact numbers, but I remember when I ran them by my lay leader who worked in pretty high levels in international businesses for a while, she looked at the numbers and said, that's a really good deal. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. And um, yeah, I was wondering if you were leaning toward, you know, kind of jumping in with that and, and if, yeah, good. So thanks for sharing that. But you like, yeah. the, you like the model and the approach of, like you said, meeting the needs, that fits your vision statement mm -hmm. first, and then building relationships out of mm -hmm. the the need meeting. Mm -hmm. Beautiful, like you said, very Christ-like approach. And then inviting people, because you have shown them Christ's love, inviting them to know Christ, right? And, right. Uh, yeah, it's yeah. beautiful. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So the, the primary, again, a big piece of vision is what is your strategy for meeting new people. And it's very clear in the table, right? And in Anne's approach, um, the strategy for meeting new people is, is offering mm -hmm. to meet their real need. Mm -hmm. That's the strategy, right? And you meet new people because you're meeting needs that, that you know, kind of can bring people out of the woodwork that you would never meet otherwise. And um, if their perception is the church can't, like Kay said, <laughs> It's a perception that the church can't meet our need, not even our spiritual needs. That's one of the things I heard her saying. People are saying the church can't do this for us anymore. That's really sad when that's the perception that people in our community have, you know, that 
you, in order to shift the perception of the unchurched people in the community, you've got to meet, you've got to find a way. What's the need and how are we going to meet it? And uh, so thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Brett or Jenny, who's next? I'll, I'll go. Okay. Um, I went to the, the school in Sackets Harbor. We had done a Bible club previously. And I put in a, an application to use the building to do a Bible club again, and they were very receptive. Mm. Uh, so I spoke with the school secretary, the school nurse, who said they had an immediate need for um, socks and lip balm, and our church donated them. So long story short, we are scheduled to go into the school and have an after-school Bible club wow. uh, starting February 28th um, at 230 wow. 345. Um, I've got 200 of these applications, registration applications that are going to go out to each student, um, K through five, I'm hoping to get 20 to 25 kids to come for, uh, wow. uh first a snack and a song. And then, uh, we're go we decided to do, um, parables, Jesus stories. And the theme is, um, uh, friends of Jesus. That's wh who we are. We is um, a, a retired couple from my church and another woman who has expressed interest in getting out into the community. And my pastor who's in, was in theater and he's very creative and, and he's a singer, um, mm -hmm. all very excited. This came out of a, an SPRC meeting where he expressed wow. an, a, a desire, a, a calling to work with kids. And I said, well, let's, let's see if we can get back into the schools after COVID. So we're, we're super excited. We're meeting this afternoon. Team is meeting this afternoon to uh, do some final planning for a snack and the games. We tell a story and then they act out the story. And then they have table conversations where they, they talk about. Some kids have told us that uh, that's the first time they ever knew about Jesus. Mm -hmm. And Going into the school, we got the support of, of the superintendent and the nurse and a couple of other teachers who have to be on the on the QT because you can't promote, um, you know, blatantly, you can't promote, but you can also encourage and smile. And um, so my next, I want to do more one-on-ones with uh, the cafeteria workers and, and the nurse and and also the Presbyterian pastor in, in Sackets and do some coffee, coffee hours. And, um, and then I liked what Kay said about uh, sending home a note with the parents when they come to sign them out saying, this is what your child talked about today. Mm. And uh, maybe you can ask him about that at, at dinner if they have dinner. Sometimes they just ignore the kids <laughs> when they get home, but the, the kid might mention it and then uh, mm -hmm. anyways, building relationships we're starting out with just five weeks before easter um and one of the other people in the team said maybe we could have it be an ongoing thing take a break and then be a presence in the school every week wow and that could that could lead to it already has led in the past to um recognizing us in the community and the kids feel comfortable when they see us introducing us to other people. So, um, so we just jumped in across that bridge after we're Beautiful. over it. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, do you have a name? Like, what are you calling this group? We're At calling the it the Awesome Bible Club. Awesome Bible Club. Beautiful. ABC. ABC. Yeah. ABC, Awesome Bible Club. That's and an awesome then, name. Yeah. Isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> and, yep. um, that's really exciting that you so it sounds like you have a team of five it yes so and, far and uh, plus the other people we introduced it in church and people are saying well i can't come but i can provide snack uh and of course we're all praying for that and i can provide money for crafts so that's the the whole church is involved in mm -hmm. one way or another mm -hmm. all 25 of us great <laughs> Well, it's very exciting, and um, I really appreciate you sharing this approach. And it sounds like you're going to do, you said you're going to do five weeks before Easter, then take a break. 
Yeah. And are, are you picturing this being like multiple short term things? Like, like you said, oh, maybe we could do it long term. But the question is always, do you have the team to do it every week, right, during school or not? Yeah. So what are you picturing right now? What do you think it's going to be like short five or six week spurts like that or? Um, in the past, it was led by the me and the pastor, and I was more physically fit than I am now. But now we've got three new people that have not been participated before. Uh, I'm hoping to mentor lots of other people that see the mm -hmm. result. And so that it'll have a life of its own and it'll be able to um, Beautiful. carry on after, after I'm dead. <laughs> mm -hmm. But I, I'm envisioning that we will be a permanent presence in the school. Um, but I also like the idea of having the parents come to a, the, in the past we have done a play at, to, to wrap up the five weeks of, of learning and the kids have put on a little play and the parents have come a little earlier than usual to, to pick them up and they got to see what the kids learned. And it's always, the parents have to sign them out legally. Um, we can't just let the kids run out to the parking lot. Um, so we get to chat with the parents yep. and just tell them how much we love their kids. And um, so that's been enlightening too. So, yeah. So this is one of the things I'm going to let um, our, our brother Brett share here too. But one of the things to think about and pray about, uh, one of the best practices we're going to talk about here in a few minutes as, as we get through the material for the gathering part of Launchpad um, is to always have a kind of a next step. So one of the things I really appreciate about Kay, what she was sharing is they have these gatherings once a month and there and there's always an invitation to the parents who maybe just come to the gathering once a month yes. to become a part of a table, right? So one of these small groups that we, so that's something to think about. If there was somebody who came, their kids are coming to after school, they come to your event at the end of the five weeks, I'm challenging you to think about what kind of a thing, like a small group, for instance, could you invite parents to that would be a next step for them if they love what you're doing with their kids and they're seeing their family life is changing because of this interaction their kids are having at school, if they wanted to do something more, you could invite them just to come to worship and maybe you feel good enough about worship that that's the place next step for them. But I'm challenging you to pray about what could be another kind of next step to get mm -hmm. parents together that want to talk about, like Ann talks about all the time, you know, we're trying to help them raise their kids. That's her vision, right? To raise kids. What's the language you use, Ann, in a difficult... Uh, the challenge, joyful, the joyful and challenging. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> joyful and challenging task of raising children. You know, if there's parents who really want some help they want some support they're dying for some interaction with other parents you know is there a way you can provide that go ahead paul yeah i mean just i i agree conceptually like or or if you have a ministry that's not so churchy you know uh every thursday we have an ecumenical men's lunch and we get a lot of different people for that not everything has to have hymns and liturgy um and and once a month uh, it'll be this thursday actually we live stream it's, uh, it's called Sauce and Cross. We have a pasta-ish dinner with gluten-free <laughs> options. Well, it's it's like ziti. It's usually some kind of pasta, ziti, lasagna. Apparently, Jenny, there's quite a lot of options when it comes to pasta. Who knew, right? <laughs> um, and then and then we have a, uh, you know, I would call it a seeker-sensitive service. It's, it's maybe for people that, um, uh, you know, I, I like Kay's terms, what spiritual but not religious. And there are some people that are that are already devout Christians. And we usually get, you know, 30, 40 people to come to that, to the, well, more to the dinner, because then people peace out because they just were there for the food. But then we get about 30 or 40 people to come to the service, but they're there, even though it's in a church sanctuary, because it's more laid back. We have a guitar player, we have a praise team. I usually show a video and, and it's a very simple um, message. This Thursday, I'm preaching about work-life balance. So as soon as I say that, everyone's going to look at me and laugh, and I'll say it's an aspirational message. <laughs> um, 
but but basically it's 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 basic things it could be fear it could be love and um so i, I guess where i'm going with this is there, there are avenues um mm -hmm. to connect with people and and to um uh, link up with people that that don't have to be sunday morning and yep. there's um there's a ministry too uh it, it kind of goes inactive during the winter but it's called ladies night out and it's like a once a month dinner at a local restaurant that you know there's a prayer maybe a little devotion then it's just interaction i mean i it's nice to have ministries where we don't have to make motions or second or check parliamentary procedures or make sure dave put that in the minutes um, you know so once in a while it's good to just be able to get together with people and not have to have all of the other stuff amen so. yeah great thank you so brett you got your your two your colleagues have taken more than two or three minutes God bless yeah. them, but do your best, brother. <clears throat> Methodists are talkers, Dave. Yes, we are. Unless we're introverted and then short and sweet. Um, so, you know, what I'm envisioning is kind of an amalgamation of other experiences and other ideas that I've heard. Uh, but it's a space where children are free to explore who they are as God created them. So they can build relationships with others through play, creative expression. And adventure activities. Um, Did you say adventure activities? Yes. Beautiful. Okay, good. That's um, like a vision statement to me. Yeah. Nice. Can you repeat that for us? A space where children are free to explore who they are as God created them so they can build relationships with others through play, creative expression, and adventure activities. Beautiful. Um, so I'm seeing it not necessarily in the church building. Um, you know, that's kind of the last resort. Um, I, I'd love to work with a community partner, whether it's the library, the school. Um, you know, I have a little bit of an end with the fire department, so you know, maybe use their meeting space. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it would be... Monday after school from three to five, uh, K through 12 gets out at two 30. Um, so, you know, there's some, tra there's the ability for travel time to get them there. Um, you know, through the buses they're walking, depending on exactly where it is. Um, and, you know, I see a session kind of working, out, uh, having a short gathering activity. Um, I have a parishioner who's my SPPRC chair. She works at St. Lawrence and she has a lot of interaction with um, international students and uh, just the diverse uh, student body of, of St. Lawrence. Uh, so she expressed interest in helping and also uh, creating some uh, connections to help you know, college students participate as well. Um, and then they can choose what kind of activity they want to participate, um, you know, games, individual play, art or music, uh, stories, uh, some kind of snack. Um, if you don't already know this, St. Lawrence County is the poorest county in the state mm. and food insecurity is a very real thing up here. Um, so mm. just having that snack, you know, not knowing if the kid is going to be able to have dinner or not, uh, it is going to be a key component. Um, and then, you know, some kind of closing activity um, in a camp style uh, with some fun camp songs and, um, you know, engaging. And then some kind of, you know, mini morality, you know, message around the golden rule kind of thing. Um, So that's that's what I've come up with so far. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, work in progress. It's great. Do you have Good. any other people that you've shared this idea with yet, or is this still in your in your heart? Um, I've I've shared it with uh, my SPRC chair, um, and I've I've mentioned it in worship, you know, to discern. You know, if you're interested in helping with this, um, 
I'm in the process of setting up a one-on-one -on -one with a church member who's uh, got some young kids, but you know, like so many of us with young kids can't attend or their kids can't go or, or whatever, mm -hmm. um, just to, you know, have a community member that, you know, isn't as active as they used to be um, to get their perspective and, you know, see if I can get him on board with helping. Um, but that's about as far as I've gotten in, in terms of building a team. Yeah. Very good. Well, Ann is the expert um, at partnering with college students, and uh, she knows so much more than I do about these kinds of relationships. And um, so um, I don't know if the two of you have had that conversation yet, but um, I think college students have been a huge part of your teams, right, Ann, over the years? Yeah, yeah. And, and Brett, your all of the models sound so exciting. Brett, I'd be happy to talk one-on-one -on -one about how you can offer, uh, call the schools and see. I had one student get some field experience credit for doing that, for, for teaching, um, or just so that person can write it down on a resume um, it is great. I mean, there's challenges with college students because they go on spring break, fall break, they get finals, they fall in and out of love with boyfriends and girlfriends and other people. <laughs> Well, like their hearts and, <laughs> and they're and they're just like ah, but um, they're awesome and um, the energy and enthusiasm is great. Um, yeah, yeah. So absolutely, let's let's talk about that if you'd like. And you know, I'm here for you always, everyone. Yep. Sounds good. Thanks. Well, this is really really great. Um, Folks, I really appreciate you all sharing where you're at right now, and I can hear the development in your thinking and praying about this stuff. And um, I'm going to kind of use the rest of our time today to fly through some material. This is kind of the week with actually more material to share, and we have less time than ever. So I'm going to share my screen. And uh, we're gonna... Dave, is it all right if we take like a, a two minute break? Absolutely. Now is a good time. Yeah, I love coffee, but there are side effects. So. I, there are. So let's yeah. let's actually let's actually take a four minute break. How's that? We'll come back you, and you you radical, Dave Maslin. Yeah, I know. I'm just let's so make it hurt. four four minutes and fifteen seconds. I, that's, that's, we should have nuts. <laughs> let's do it. Let's do it. Okay, so we'll be back together in just a couple minutes, friends.
Hello, it's a good time to come in. I'm taking a break. Warming up my tea. How you doing, baby? Good, got it done. I'll put stuff away. Good time to do it. Right, brother? Right. I'll just turn the heat on in here. It's all right. Not me. Let me see. <laughs> Anybody else down there, baby? Um, someone put a load in and left about um, two minutes ago. But... Hey, Dave. Yeah, go ahead, Ann. Sorry, I have my computer on. Just so folks know, Department of Social Services will go to any church that's looking to be a child care center. Because if it's going to be a licensed child care center, they have to approve the spacing and they're going to give you all the parameters of how many people with kids. So for folks that might not right now want sort of the model that Kay is offering to be licensed, it's understood that the Department of Human Services, Child Services, they come, they inspect your area. They provide you with all that information because you're going to have to go online in Albany and register and take the test with them. So um, those parameters and all that information is available for your charge. In fact, you still have to, um, regardless of right. what anybody offers through a church, you still have to go through your county to be registered. I just thought that was an important point that I wanted people to hear. You're not yeah. just free to go through a church program and consider yourself licensed you you have to register with the county and, and you're then registered with the governor's office like i am to be a, a child licensed child care center so those, those are important legal things that people need to understand yeah. in the state of new york well and some of the services i think what you're, i hear you saying too you know we've kind of already paid for through our state taxes right and federal taxes are to provide some of those services just in terms of the information about how many right. children per classroom and how many teachers those are all there's laws and that information is available to us and you have to be inspected in us you know and um whether how you can serve food or whether you have to get prepackaged food and the state will and the county will also provide food for you um largely through a BOCES program so just to be aware don't duplicate um, don't reinvent the wheel when if you're going to be a licensed center uh, you're going to be charging that the county has to approve it anyway. Right, right. Thank you for that experience. Okay, well, welcome back, everybody. And um, I needed to reheat my tea, too, so that was good. So I'm going to share, um, share the PowerPoint, and um, we're going to there's a lot of, I think, helpful material here that is uh, relevant to um, each of your ideas as you are thinking about your own particular vision. Um, I just realized that I have two PowerPoints open. I think this is the right one. Yes, it is. Okay. <clears throat> So, um, yeah, and I meant to actually start that before I shared it. <clears throat> and we'll try again. 
Here we go. So again, um, just a reminder of this slide that we continue to discern. You know, you've done some work on visioning, but the discernment continues. Today we're talking about the season of gathering, um, but we continue as we think about this work of gathering, which is a different kind of work. We continue to realize that our vision is being shaped as we gather people. Um, we actually can um, continue to learn and remember that Let's see, next week, like about a month from now will be our last time together. And you will be on at that point and you'll be asked to do a, a quite, a, quite a significant amount deeper sharing than what you just shared. And part of that will be kind of a six month, although our, our friend uh, Jenny, it sounds like you're gonna be launching your new thing before we're done. So you're gonna have, you, you should have about a, what do you have? Um, two weeks before you launch. Is that true, Jenny? February twenty-eight. Okay, so you got you got a month. So yeah. your to-do list is it's shorter than most everybody else's in the group here. <laughs> you got a lot to think through. Um, hopefully, today's materials will be helpful. So we already did this, and um, thank you for sharing that. So. Um, we are inviting you to think a little bit about critical mass. This is a really important question for those planting traditional churches, but it's important even for what you're working on. Um, it's really thinking about, you know, the the volume of people. What does it look like, you know, if you're if you're doing a small group program? Critical mass obviously is more than three or four people. You know, I think five or six, my wife and I started a small group in the church that we're in, and we kind of felt like, well, we, we want six people or more, because when you have four and somebody's sick, you don't have much of a group anymore, <laughs> you know. So again, it's just important to think about critical mass, both in terms of how many people do you have in the room? Um, and again, if you have a bunch of small groups, then you can think about what makes a small group, too. When does it get too big and when do we split? You know, those are the kinds of things you think about with small groups. But you also might be thinking in terms of how many people do we need on the team? You know, how many kids do we expect to have? Jenny, you said 25 or so, hopefully. Um, that's a lot of kids, right? And so you really want to think about how many people do we need there so that if we have an emergency, we've got enough people to stay with the 24 and a couple people can, you know, you're always thinking about things like that. So critical mass has to do with not only the number of total number of people in the room and the energy that you have in the room, but also you're thinking about, you know, how many people do you need in your team there uh, at any time? So the, crit the, the factors, how many people do we need for the strategy? and you're thinking about how many people are committed short term. So Jenny's thinking about a month from now, you know, in those five weeks, right? She's planning for that, but she's also got to think in terms of long term. Um, what are the spaces that are available? Um, I heard uh, pretty clearly um, that um, Brett is thinking about where and spaces maybe other than the church. Um, how much does that space allow? Right. So if you if you've got a space and it really the maximum number of people in a space is 50, um, what is critical mass for that space? Maybe 20 or 30 is what you want. But whereas if you're using a big fellowship hall or a big fire hall, maybe you want something bigger just to have the energy, a number that's bigger in mind. So those are things about critical mass. We're not going to spend a lot of time on that today, but there are things to think about. Um, one of the ideas that I'm hoping you'll think about is where do you meet those first 50 people? And again, you're thinking both in terms of who are the people on your team and who are the people that you're just inviting? Who are the people in your target group? So you're thinking about both. You folks, because you have existing churches, you already have, you've already met the first 50 people, probably, you've got this audience of people you can invite to be part of it. 
But so your mother church is part of that. But I want you to think in terms of how can you recruit some people that are not in the church, some parents that are not in the church, that's part of your target group to actually be on your team. So that's a best practice is that half of the people on your team are already churched and the other half are not because you want their perspective as you're making decisions. I hope you can see the value in that. Um, if you're trying to create a ministry for people that are not churched people, if the only people making decisions are church people, you're not going to have the perspectives that you need. So I hope that you'll be thinking about meeting people. That's why one-on-ones with people outside the church are so important. That's why it's good that you're thinking about how can I meet some people from the school or the college um, outside the church. Uh, it's really good, good best practice. So again, you're thinking about where can we meet and how can we meet the people in our target group and how can we begin to invite them into this um, ministry? So people that are planters think about, first of all, they think about online gatherings. It's something that's much more a part of our life now after COVID. Um, I, I hope that you intend to have an online presence of some kind. Um, I'm not talking about that you are streaming everything you do. That's not what I mean. What I mean is that one of the places to meet people are online um, groups, Facebook groups, you know, create a face group, big Facebook group where it's easy for people to invite new people to be a part of it and to learn what's going on. Um, one of the things that I have learned from our Spanish speaking brothers and sisters of all different cultures that are church planters um, is that the best way to meet new people is through community events. So, um, you know, all of our Hispanic um, new church starts throughout the state, and there's about seven of them now, every one of them, their primary way that they meet new people is through festivals and they provide they're they're very much focused on children um, activities for kids food that kids like to eat bounce houses and games and music and all kinds of things designed to bring children and their families together to enjoy a, a fun day in the community and then to make sure the leaders that are there actually meet and have a conversation with everybody who shows up and in any case possible, get their contact information, begin to just build relationships with new people, and then always to have that invitation to the next thing. So there's the invitation given to worship. There's the invitation given to children's ministries, whatever you might be doing. And um, so that's, that's a way to meet new people that are, Spanish-speaking brothers and sisters um, are utilizing to meet new people in their communities. So uh, again, these are ideas, ways of meeting new people. Um, and you're thinking in terms of all of these groups, and some of this is what Kay talked about, you know, de-churched people, people that have, you know, been in the church in the past and have just decided it's not for them for whatever reason, people who identify as spiritual but not religious. Interestingly enough, um, many of our church planters are meeting new people as they provide opportunities in the community for service. So, I think there's a lot of people in our community that would love to have an opportunity to serve others. They volunteer all the time. They're not church people, but they're volunteers. And so when the church gives people the opportunity to serve, that's an opportunity for you, for us to get to know them. So service opportunities are actually a great doorway for new families to meet new families. So, um, we're encouraging you to be creative in terms of creating opportunities for people to not just come and be served, but to serve. I hope you hear that. And it's an interesting way to meet people. So, Anne, 
if you could just take a minute to tell us where have you found and how have you connected with new families? Where do, where do you meet people for the first time? Yeah, well, you know, I, I, I guess I have used the church as the well for people to come to because that is where free child care is offered. Um, I have, I immediately, when I came to Watertown, uh, connected with the school superintendent and got on the parent and community advisory team and met people through the school district. Um, but I meet people literally by, by through social media and connection, having people come to request childcare. And uh, we've had a couple of new Fort Drum families come. Um, we do post advertise on the Fort Drum family uh, Facebook page. I actually have a chaplain, I'm very sad to say he'll be leaving shortly. He's being transferred to Fort Hamilton. But I've just made connections between Fort Drum and the Watertown School District that the families do come and um, through the child care ministry, make it very open that they can stay with their child as long as they want and um, just really try to ask deep questions about their kids. And above all, you know, when it comes to goals with child care ministry for my staff, my goal is not to provide necessarily mental health care. I'm not a mental health care professional or even educational goals, although we've offered tutoring. My goal is to love children unconditionally and celebrate the wonder and joy of young children. So the only thing I ask anyone to do is to passionately love children as Jesus loved children. And that's what we're special at really doing is just listening and loving the whole child and not looking at the child as some sort of educational diagnosis and ADHD, uh, right. you know, uh, whatever. I, I'm looking at a child as a wonderful creation of God to celebrate what we can see that child brings to us and how we can impact that child. So our goal is spiritually to be the golden rule in action, but we get people to come because we advertise well and we are connected through Fort Drum Facebook page for the families and the school district posts everything that we offer. Beautiful. That's because I do not teach religious curriculum. We model the golden rule and most secular people get the golden rule, love and respect others yep. You want to be loved and respected. I don't get a lot of arguments that that's anything intrusive. I've also connected with the county in terms of the Youth Action Corps that got free youth to come in. And with Jefferson Community College, I networked with them to get students to get field placements. So yep. I did a lot of legwork by developing community partnerships. Yeah, beautiful. But I hear the primary... Um, pathway to meeting new people is simply by offering something that meets needs. Yes, yes, yep. Yep. exactly. And to do it at time, we intentionally offer time when traditional child care centers are closed to give parents extra time to go to appointments, yep. um, shopping, to grab dinner, to fix their home. We have, we watch kids on Saturday their parents are often fixing something in the house and not wanting little kids to be around paint and wires being, you know. So, yeah, we I mean, look to supplement, not to compete with child care. Yeah, it's beautiful. And we've talked about that a lot this morning, that meet a real need and you'll meet people. That's what I'm hearing today a lot. And I really appreciate that uh, perspective. So these are just, I'm just going to share this briefly again. You'll get this PowerPoint if you want to look at this in more detail. But, you know, um, think in terms of um, these different groups of people um, and what they're looking for. Um, I think some of these middle <clears throat> pieces are important. I, you know, I hear in Emily's <clears throat> um, mission vision statement this piece about um, peace and justice uh, work, 
you know, there will be some young people that that will be what they're attracted to, right? Is this idea of working for justice in the community. And um, there will be others that are just lonely. <clears throat> and and that's a huge part of life. I'm finding people coming out of COVID are just desperate for um, conversation and relationships. So those are needs too, that I think you can you can name in your vision statement, right? Those are the kinds of things that you're looking, those needs you're looking to meet. Okay, so <clears throat> like I said, I'm hoping you also think in terms of finding people for your teams. And um, we're just gonna fly through some of this material. Um, we're saying that you need two types of teams. And again, this is material that comes from SLI, and I know some of you have done some work with the conference um, around SLI work. Uh, when we talk about L3, that's SLI material. Um, they talk in terms of having two different types of teams, teams that do adaptive work and teams that do technical work. And all that means is adaptive work, you need a team, a single team, who are thinking about the things that we do not already know how to do. They're the people that are doing learning work. They're giving thought to things. They're strategizing. They're innovating. They're constantly thinking along with you what is working and what isn't. You know, this was our vision. This was our strategy. What's working well and what isn't. You know, you've got a group of people you meet with at least once a month. And you're doing this adaptive work of thinking about constantly improving things. And then you have teams of people, in some cases, individual people who are doing technical work, things that folks already know how to do. So Jenny, when you talk about somebody to do food, right? That's technical people. You know, we have a lot of people in the Methodist churches that know how to do the technical work of creating and serving food. That's where we're really rich in that. I find that's something we know how to do well. That's a very technical task. And there's probably people that you can say, you know, we've got this after school program on this date. We've got some other people that help with food, but they're not available on this date. And there's just somebody you can trust. You, they can provide food for a day or a month, and you know you, they can do it. That's a technical work, something they know how to do. It has a beginning and it has an end. That's technical. That's a technical team, and we all need people serving on those kinds of that kind of work. So for your adaptive team, that's basically you, you need one of those, and everybody needs this. You need a, a vision team, a core team that will be working with you. Some of you already have one in place. That's what I hear you. You're, you know, Jenny said they're gonna have a meeting this afternoon, but they're, this is a small team and they are learning together. So you do L3 with this group because you're constantly wanna learn. What are we missing? What are we hearing from our parents? Like Kay was talking about this. You know, what are the needs that we're hearing about and how can we help meet those needs in a better in a better way? There's a high level of trust because these people are together. SLI suggests at least eight hours per month. That's a lot, but it is it, it is the kind of commitment and time together that allows people to go deep enough to have really open and honest conversation. So if you're meeting once a month for an hour and a half with your team, you might think about, is there a way that we could increase our time together so that our work goes even deeper. Um, that's what SLI is suggesting. We, we did eight um, hours uh, a month for a year. Now we meet once a month for two, three hours, but it, it made a difference. We know each other really well. Yeah, so you went deep that first year and that's a really good, you know, I'm, I'm for most church planters, I'm suggesting to them that they meet every single week in that first six months to a year, every week so that they go deep. That's, that's a great way that you did that. Um, I think part of the problem too is, is, you know, we, as people, we tend to want things to happen quick. Just sometimes you just have to like, you know, it's like, it's like an old school coffee maker. You have to let things perk, you know, get together and, and don't, don't, uh, you know, stifle the Holy spirit. Things just take time sometimes. Right. And, uh, that I'm a type A guy by nature. So with SLI, I'm like, what's with this eight hour crap, Dave? 
why do we have to do this? And now on the other end of it, I'm like, all right, it makes sense. So yeah, yeah. it's about going deep in your relationships, right? So the L3 idea is the loving, taking the time to love God and love each other enough that you're going, you really are praying for each other every week and caring for each other. So the technical work again um, is the work that we already know how to do. And the teams only meet as needed and they they are only committed. And again, they can be small teams and in some cases, um, larger teams are needed for certain things. But um, for the adaptive team, you want creative people. What you don't want are people that just wanna get things done and are frustrated. <laughs> by these meetings where you spend a lot of time you know you know um getting all warm and fuzzy with each other you know for a half an hour at the beginning of the meeting um and we we had some drop off and that's okay yeah yeah and it it, is, it does happen but think about who you're inviting to your core team um it's possible jenny that some of the people coming to your meeting this afternoon will be much happier just being on a task team to get some things done that need to be done, as opposed to thinking with you all of the 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 kind of deep thought that you need as this goes forward. How can we take this after school program and invite people to something more? That's a different kind of work, you know, and discernment work that some people are just not comfortable with. Dave, can I interject? You you mentioned the food um, and the Methodist people. I have people that are really good at making a plate of cookies. They think that's going to be great for the kids. And I also have kids that are gluten intolerant and yep. you can't just put a plate of cookies in front of kids with COVID. So they have to be adaptable and comfortable with the change. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Yeah. So those are things that you're keeping in mind as you think about who to invite on your team, right? You're kind of be careful about that. How adaptive are they? Yeah. So yeah, people that are comfortable on task teams are really good people with like, they like checklists. They like to get things done. They know how to do things and they just do them, right? And you can trust them, but they get bored sitting around talking about unknown things for too long. And there's people that are the other way too, right? They get so bored with tasks, but they love sitting around thinking about why and how, you know, and strategizing together. So um, think about, you know, what are, who are these people and what are they like? And again, this is a list that is more typical for somebody planting a church, but it might help you. Um, Emily, you're talking about, you know, if you're going to get into this um, table model, I can imagine that you're going to need multiple kinds of people working with you I, i'm picturing you might have multiple staff and so you know you need um, different kinds of people um, i hope all of you will find some people who their only part of this is that they're praying for you have a prayer team and have them partner with you and just check in once a month and so they know how to pray for you um, and the ministry that's going on. But you you want somebody that's thinking about hospitality for new people. If you're going to do music, you're going to need a musician at least. If you're going to do food, you're going to need people that can do food. Um, if you're going to have a, an online presence, again, these, these are just ki the kinds of things to think about. How are you going to make sure the tech, if you're going to have sound system, you can't do all this alone. I guess that's what I'm saying, <laughs> that you need at least individual people to be thinking about these things. And in the best case scenario is that you've got a team of people, even if it's just two people that are thinking about each, each of these aspects of ministry you might be doing. Any questions about adaptive work, adaptive team, and task teams before we move on? All right, how are we doing on time? It's about quarter after. I think we're in a pretty good shape. Again, this is just to reiterate L3. We we recommend that every team that meets um, practices L3. And again, it's about 
uh, process at the beginning of every team meeting where you are loving Christ and loving each other. And then that you're also doing some learning together. And learning can take lots of different shapes. Um, it can be reading a book together and discussing it. It can be having someone come like we did today and have Kay come and speak to the group. Um, it can be um, just, you know, taking a poll over a period, you know, with everybody who's participating, asking a series of questions once every six months about how things are going, and then having a team meeting where you just look at everybody's answers to your, to your poll and see what you learn together about how things are going and what you could work on to make it even better. Um, and then the leading part, which is the part that most people think of as a team meeting, <laughs> doesn't get done until all the rest of that is done because then the decision-making, because your relationships are deeper and because you've done so much learning, the decision-making almost always goes much quicker and easier. Everybody tends to be on the same page. You're not arguing for for space and power within the group about when you're trying to make a decision, everybody's all pulling together already. And the leading part, which is about making decisions together, um, goes a lot easier. That's L3. So we're not going to spend any more time on that. Okay. Um, these are just some best practices that I'm going to share quickly. And again, you're going to get this PowerPoint. So you're going to have all this material. And we are taping, by the way. I, I want to thank Brett for that reminder. Just as Kay started talking, he sent me a little note, Dave, are we taping? And I meant to start the tape and I didn't until she started talking. So we are, you will get a copy of this as well. But um, just to very quickly go through some of this material. Um, in your first small team gathering, um, begin to allow people to experience your vision for making disciples. So even in your meeting today, Jenny, at least talk about the vision. Talk about why you're doing this with the children. What's the purpose behind it? What's your why? And begin to invite people to commit to that so they're just as committed as you are. Practice L3, as we've been talking about. Give people opportunities to commit. And so a best practice of church planter is this, to ask for short-term commitments from people. Sometimes people are really hesitant to say yes because they're afraid if they say yes, this could be a lifelong commitment and it's going to be really hard and I'm going to have to make the pastor angry when I say I have to be done with this. So a best practice is to ask for short-term commitments three months at a time or six months at a time, and to ask people, will you come and be there? Will you commit to be there every single time we gather for this group of time? And then at the end of that time, we're going to revisit. And you can decide to re-up if you want to, but you it's okay for you at that point. There'll be no anxiety over you saying, you know, I finished my time. I'm going to move on and do something else now. Um, ask for short-term commitments from people. So, Jenny, you might in your meeting today, you know, establish a bit of a covenant with people and say, okay, we're going to do this five week block of time. I'm asking for you, can you commit to be at our team meetings over the next three months? And can you show up to every after school for those five weeks? Maybe that's what you want to ask for today. Um, but you're asking for short term and then just promise them and write on your calendar when we have a team meeting to kind of debrief the five weeks, you can revisit with them. Is this something you want to continue doing or is it time to find some others? That's just kind of a, a church planter best practice that um, really works for these kinds of ministries, I think. Um, <clears throat> from the beginning, again, best practice. You want people to be financially committed to this kind of ministry, too. From the beginning, give people on your leadership team opportunities to give of their own money to make the dream a reality. Um, all of your ministries are going to take money. If you're going to feed people, there's an expense there. Now, hopefully, you can get church people to donate. Uh, there's there's a financial commitment, too, to make, right? You want to ask people to commit to donating food 
Um, but any kind of ministry you're going to have with children is going to cost some money. Emily, Emily's got to raise. It sounds like if they're going with the table, she's got to she's got to find some money. And maybe Emily, maybe your church has got lots of money, and it's just endowment money you're going to use. But my guess is that you're going to need some money. And what I'm suggesting is right from the beginning, you're giving up people opportunities to give. Emily, do you have a comment to share about that? Yeah, so part of part of what we are going to do funding-wise is just encourage direct donations from the congregation. Mm-hmm. Part of what we're doing is we will probably be tapping into an endowment um, one way or another because another layer in this conversation for all of us is that our building right now is in need of at least $350,000 of repairs, probably closer to Five thousand, five hundred thousand or more. Ouch. Um, and so, one way or another, we're going to have to hit the endowment um, at least a little bit. But then the other funding piece that we're that we're working on is grant money. Um, Kay very quickly in passing mentioned childcare deserts. There are state and federal grants associate. Uh, associated with or available to rather um people who are starting child care centers in child care deserts and so you know we were <laughs> we were looking at a, a map of geneva to see whether there are child care deserts here in geneva we found out that the church is literally on the street that is the boundary line between not child care desert and yes mm. child care desert. Mm. Unfortunately, we're on the wrong side of that line, <laughs> but we're oh also looking at other locations in town that we might consider. Because mm-hmm. um, mm-hmm. part um, of the decision too, Anne was talking earlier about making sure that we're in compliance with all the laws and yeah. whatnot. Yes. Yeah. And part yeah. of that too is uh, the building itself. So we learned, for instance, that the Geneva Church, since most of our classrooms are on the second floor, there's a whole thing about fire escapes and needing to put on like external fire escape ladders and whatnot. But even then, I hadn't thought this through, which I feel silly about because of the ages of my own kids. You you couldn't put infants upstairs Correct. Because if there's a fire, you can't carry a baby down a fire escape ladder quickly enough. Right. New York State law is that is that no children under 18 months old yep. may be on the second floor. Wow. I never knew that. Child care center. It is against New York State law. So I moved our nursery down. And the other issue is you can only have as a licensed daycare center one person per two kids that are 18 months or younger it meant that the worker can hold a baby on each hip so you can't you have to really know your numbers and you cannot be approved until your county comes in and inspects your kitchen your area you have to have direct access from the baby nursery to an outdoor opening to an outdoor exit door you have these are things only your county can come in tell you and approve so i'm not pleased here i'm not trying to in any way undermine all the great things k is doing i'm saying regardless it will be your county and state that will license you so please contact human services through your county and they're gracious and they're wonderful they're desperate for child care centers but they are the licensing people Hmm. not some religious group please get it through them And Anne's right about contacting them. And I would build on that and say, contact them early. We, um, gosh, we did something really smart that I cannot take any credit for. This was my lay leader's idea. Um, And she called the the county's licensing office for childcare centers, spoke with the director of that, um, that group and, and told the director kind of roughly what we were thinking and said, could you just help us have an idea of what we need to look at in terms in terms of adaptations to the building and whether it's even feasible in our building and whatnot. And she, the head of that department, actually came out and spent like an hour and a half walking wow. through the building with us 
no charge. Um, yep. She walked through the building with us and taught us all of these things about fire escapes and whatnot. Even things like, our, I, I didn't know that a nursery where there are going to be infants has to have two separate sinks because one cannot wash hands after diaper changes in the same sink where one fills a bottle. Wow. Um, oh my gosh. Yeah, it, makes, just, it all makes sense though. It does. It, it all makes perfect sense. It's yeah. just stuff I had thought of ahead of time. And so, um, yeah, all of that is to say, just to reiterate what Ann said, like reach out to your county licensing office and have someone come if you're if you're toying with the idea of doing anything licensed childcare related, have someone come and look at the site and talk you through some of these specific things. That's yeah, great and advice. also know you don't have to be licensed if you're providing childcare 12 or less than 12 hours a week and you can have kids no more than three hours. So if, if you had, for example, a drop-in childcare center from four to seven at night when traditional childcare centers are closing, you do not have to be licensed in terms of putting the two sinks in. You don't have to follow all those regs. It becomes a church ministry. You still register with the governor's office as a provider of child care, but that's another way to get around because I have an old dinosaur building too. Yeah. And I have to move <laughs> things to put a nursery downstairs. But there are other ways if your church isn't necessarily looking to you know, be a 503C licensed childcare center, you could do it, you know, you could do it four days a week um, for three hours. Okay, so it's 12 no hours. More, yeah, interesting. It's no more than three hours per shift. Per once day, yeah. Have, per day. Once you have kids more than three hours, you, on a consecutive basis, you have to be licensed. In gotcha. And, and question for you real quick. Your, your leaders of A Little Child Will Lead Them, do you put them through safe sanctuaries training too? Absolutely. Yeah, well, it's online now too. So I- uh, I, right. I I'm one of the her. trainers for it. But yeah, they have to do safe sanctuary. They have to mm -hmm. do sexual harassment training. They have yeah. to have background checks. We follow Good. all those rules. Yeah, that's great. Training, training, and more training, right? So Jenny, we're all seeing the value of partnering with the school and meeting in the school. Yes. Right? I had to name the school as extra insured, other insured. Right. Through the brotherhood. Yeah. They want but to make you know sure their brotherhood. their facilities are already set up and meeting guidelines. So right. yeah, yeah. But still all of my team is going to be safe sanctuary trained. Yeah. Right. Obviously. Right. Well, this is great conversation. I really appreciate all of that sharing, and it's a good learning for all of us. Again, the point of this slide is to give people on your leadership team, you know, give everybody in your church an opportunity to give, but there's, I think, a higher level of accountability within your leadership team, and you can, what I'm suggesting is that as the leader, you share with them what you, specifically what you're giving every week to this and how you're giving so the money you know, the money you're giving is going to go to this and then invite them to do the same thing. Challenge them to give with you. You invite the whole congregation to give too, but there's kind of an extra level of accountability for the people on the, the decision-making team. The point is don't wait six months or three months or a year to start asking people to give money and surprise them with it. Give them right up front an opportunity to give and help make it happen. Okay, we're almost through the slides. Um, again, have an idea of a progression of activities. And again, this is this is the best practice I mentioned earlier to Jenny. You know, when you have people together, make sure you have something to invite them to next. Know in your mind, what's a next step? If there's a parent or there's a kid that says, oh, I love this after school program. Is there anything else during the week I could come to? Make sure you know what you can invite them to. Have a plan for what the next thing is for everybody. And always when you have people together, make sure you're inviting them to the next th thing. Um, again, another best practice is if you want to reach diverse people, in your community, if that's your goal, is to have 
um, a diverse t- a diverse um, new faith community, diverse ministry with the diverse children. Have a balanced team. Make sure your ministry is reflected in its leaders, eth- ethnically, generationally, socioeconomically. So in every way, um, make sure you're recruiting people that are not just like you. In other words, if you want to reach people that are not just like you, make sure you have them on your team. And up front, if you have multiple people leading singing or leading your Bible story or leading you know, the um, the games that you're talking about doing, uh, Brett, you know, have diverse people um, doing uh, the leadership up front. Okay, so that gets us through the material. Thank you very much for your patience as I flew through a lot. Anybody have a key takeaway from anything you heard from Kay or from our conversation today? What do you want to make sure you take with you from this day? I think the integration piece is so essential and Kay kept reiterating that and I hear us talking about that too. Um, The way we're framing it here is that we're looking at this as an income producing signature ministry. So there are all sorts of church leadership resources out there now that are saying that the church, the, the, the fiscal model of the church being supported by people in the pews and money in the plates is not sustainable into the future, um, is not sustainable right now for a lot of churches. And so finding other income streams, but also staying missionally focused. And so what we've experienced a lot here is people will people will come up with ideas on one extreme or the other, either they're income producing or their ministries but to marry the two so that so that the 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 ministry is at least self-sustaining financially and able to fund its own growth too. Yep. Um I think that's but also to make sure that that the venture is a fully integrated ministry that's making disciples um keeping both of those parts kind of a hundred percent there that integration i think is is my my key takeaway beautiful anybody else yeah i i think uh you know dave you're you hit you hit the nail on the head i mean uh, coming out of covid there's a lot of people that are lonely there there's certain demographics that don't have ministries catered to them my, my men's lunch is a unique ministry in this community because there's not a lot of men's ministries. So I think um, Emily was right with the woman at the well analogy. I think you want to meet people's needs. Uh, we're, we're not just just saving souls. We're, we're also concerned about people's bodily well-beings as well, uh, which is Christian community. But in the process of that, um, people come to know Christ. And that's a good thing. Beautiful. Thank you. Anybody else have a takeaway you want to share? Um, I think being intentional about funding is also, you know, one of those key takeaways. Um, You know, too often in my experience, I've pitched a new idea or a new ministry and then it's like, okay, well, how are we going to pay for it? Um, And the ironic well, I, I say ironic, but a very God moment coincidental situation was I announced that I was mm-hmm. doing this the day that Adult Fellowship did their annual, okay, we made this much in wreath sales. We're going to divvy it up. Mm. And the the Adult Fellowship leader directly asked me how much I wanted them to set aside for this new ministry. Wow. Um, so, you know, already having a few hundred dollars in the, in the bank, you know, set aside to start advertising and, you know, run background checks and, and all of that. 
So, you know, be intentional about funding. Yeah, you're good. Thank you. My takeaway is the, the next step and the following up with the parents about what the kids learned uh, so that they can have the discussion at the table. Because uh, money, money hadn't even come up. Everybody is just willing, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we don't have financial problems at Sulphur Springs, which is a real blessing. So, yep. That's great. Praise God. It is. Well, thank you, friends. Um, I really appreciate your participation today. And um, there is um, some homework for you. <clears throat> And um, let me just share that slide real quick. So um, again, these are things that we're inviting you to think about this week, between now and next week, giving your vision. Uh, what will critical mass look like? Just think through that a little bit. What is your plan for making sure you have critical mass those first three months after your launch of um, your ministry? Um, what teams do you think your strategy will require? So at least have a list of the kinds of people that you know you're going to need. Um, and, and you know, make sure you think in terms of your core team, the people that are going to do adaptive work with you, as well as task teams. Um, and then if you don't already have one, and it sounds like a number of you already do, but if you don't already have one, make sure you develop and begin to develop a core team and work on a covenant together based on um, L3 and, and um, how often you're gonna meet, for how long, um, exactly what you're asking them to commit to. Those are important things to think about at this point if you're still forming your team. Um, Paul, yeah, go ahead, Ann. I just wanted to also share another resource that the state of New York through the governor's office has faith-based ministry grants. And often it is for children or youth in underserved areas. So even if you are a religious organization, if you're doing a faith-based ministry, um, you can register through the governor's office to receive grants. And the other issue is you can be registered as a child care or youth ministry center that doesn't necessarily require all the regulations of being a licensed daycare center or youth center or homeless center because it's faith-based. So there is this gray area that's called faith-based organizations and you register through the governor's office in Albany. I just thought you might need to know that. And could you, um, I'm going to send out an email in a little while to everybody. Could you reply to all and just put the link to that website where people would do that? Yeah, I'll look it up again. Yep. That'd be that'd be great. Just so people can find that easily. I appreciate you sharing that. Um I I guess I was not even aware of that. Um I knew the federal government was doing that for a while, but I did not know about the state level um granting for for those ministries. Thank you very much. Paul, I was just starting to say before we sign off, um yeah, I appreciate you sharing your vision and that it's much bigger than just the Sydney Church because that's your role right now. You're really looking at cooperating in ministry in that area. Um, do you think, this is just a question for you, um, and maybe you know the answer already. You have this team of people for, that I, I think is probably made up of folks from all the churches in your in your group. There's like eight or nine churches, is that right? Um, regularly meeting, I would say four or five. Uh, okay. Some churches didn't really commit, but it's like the train going around. We're hoping to get them on board. So gotcha. Gotcha. So you've got a group of churches. Um, are you picturing that there will be one new ministry for children in one of these locations? Or are you picturing you might have a model that you would try to launch things in more than one location or at least eventually get to that <laughs> i would say i would say yes and yes because i think that um some of this is is kind of happening organically in the sense that unadilla umc is doing a vacation bible school monthly um and and we're already seeing uh multiple levels of collaboration 
Um, so right. something like this, I think, Dave, would just be more of a formalization. Now, what, what's good about Sydney, as you know, from, from formally serving here, we have nothing but space here. So, uh, so Sydney becomes uh, a hub of activity, I think, just because of the, the resources we have with the building. Um, but what I would say is if, if we can multiply it in different churches, great. I mean, it's, it's a stronger ministry. And if it's in different locations, then we have a scenario where we have a deeper impact in all of these different communities. And, you know, these, these churches are struggling. They don't have pastors. We don't have pastors to give them. Um, but we want these churches to grow. So we have an interlinked ministry and where this goes in, in five years, we don't know, but um, yeah. it, it would it would be nice to not only have one location but multiple. We're we're kind of at the uh, the epicenter of this right now, and we'll see where it goes. Yeah, well, thanks. I'm just just I wanted you to know that I'm praying for all of you, uh, Paul, as you think through all that and try to lead folks to, into the future, um, and all of you as you, um, Jenny, get ready to launch very soon and Brett as you're forming your team and really imagining where um, this might take place um, please know that I'm praying for you um, let's just ask for God's help together right now God we are so grateful for your presence with us today uh, we thank you for our friend Kay and for what she shared and we thank you for this opportunity to think out loud together about new ways of reaching new people we pray for Jenny. She has a team meeting this afternoon. Help her in her leadership to know how to talk to folks, to invite them, to get excited about this vision and to commit to a certain block of time and to imagining uh, reaching lots of kids in that after school program. Please be with us, each of us, as we continue to do the work of leadership. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So thank you all, and um, I will see you a week from today, and um, we'll move on to talk about the season of discipling, which is really more conversation about how we're going to go about inviting children and their families into a walk with Christ. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. God bless you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.